Feeding Habits by Rachel Latchman Singh. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus Christ, John, chapter 6, verse 35. Chapter 1. Bad Vegetarian. There are no rules. Just remember, Eliza is vegetarian. She's into earth tones, neutral tones, leafy greens, root vegetables. It's all new. The day she announced her diet change, she also announced a desire to repaint the kitchen, to fit the new aura, to fit the new ethics. But she wants to paint the kitchen blood red, and Lonan is still a meat eater. He reminds himself, there are no rules, just remember, Eliza is vegetarian. In the hardware store, he thumbs paint chips. They're set up in an array, almost like checkers, dissolving in a gradient from reds to purples. Eliza wants red, not necessarily earthy, but the root of organism, of life. So Lonan looks at the blues. They're all a variant of a seaside theme. Sea breeze, a cloud-like blue. Beach umbrella, a wispy aqua. Seafoam serenade, muted, like the soft side of a turquoise. Repainting the kitchen matters little to him, and so do the blues, but the red section, devilish, makes him shuffle his blue deck faster. Radio from the store's intercom tins through the speakers, dampened by the hustle of carts, the thud of bodies against the concrete flooring. He holds many chips up to the light, colors he's glumly stirred when he works behind the paint counter part-time. Secret getaway in Parisian summer, almost the exact shade, but still he flicks through, until half the pile is indistinguishable and the other half are blues he likes and not reds, like Eliza's asked. Her sudden vegetarianism is not confusing to him. Eliza tries new things all the time, something he's learned after living with her for half a year. One time, she brought home four different kinds of dried beans to make into tea, and together they drank it atop the balcony, the Vegas strip across them somehow tasting better. One time, they ate a variety of kudzu foods for a week because Eliza said invasive species had to be killed somehow, and so they spooned kudzu pudding into their mouths, kudzu root powder into their water, kudzu salads with salted almonds. One time, she put them on a heat ban, and they ate only frozen peas, potatoes, raspberries, turned the thermostat down until every surface crackled. She liked the feeling of subtle frost on the countertops, how it jolted her when she touched it accidentally in the morning. He found her many mornings awake before him, transfixed to the countertop with both palms soldered to its surface, like she'd forgotten she wasn't a part of it. One time, she paid to have the furniture in the apartment rearranged, not good enough for her spirit, and then reverted it two days later. The couch doesn't like being so close to the refrigerator, she said, and he could have asked, did you ask it? But said, understandable, it shouldn't be forced to catch a draft. So her vegetarianism is normal. Already, she switched their meat supply to beetroots, chickpeas, tofu she rips apart barehanded. For the last three mornings, they've both taken a shot of spinach and ginger root, a liquid that burns to make you feel alive, as if you weren't already. Life itself, she says. I was thinking more of a cherry. Her voice makes him jump. He's still holding squares of paint to the incandescent light. This one is wave hello. She reaches around him, her arm snaking around his shoulder. She secures her thumb and forefinger around the card and studies the blue, her face pinched, and then she retreats. Too aquatic, she says, like I'm always swimming with the sharks. He's still holding the paint ship when she turns to the display, fiddling in the reds until she emerges with the square. Dear Ruby. This one, she says, her teeth glinting in the light the same time he lowers his blue paint ship. How can there be a better option? There is nothing wrong in this relationship. Everything is Eliza's new favorite adjective, stunning. Everything is scrubbed with kitchen bleach, glittering like a plasticky pool float in the shallow end, stunning. Everything is planned, put in a calendar, a notebook, a flitter of receipts, but always planned, stunning. Everything is better, even better than better, a better that can only be described as stunning. Lonan uses this word frequently now, rolling out a strip of blue painter's tape and trying to find different ways it stuns. Sticks when he sticks, peels when he peels, keeps its edge when it needs to keep its edge, so it's stunning. The bubble television is turned onto a channel about sheep, and as he lines the baseboards, outlets, catches glances of a shear buzzing against skin, sometimes a hunting knife slicing until there's blood. 
Eliza is asking a neighbor for paint rollers because they bought four cans of wall paint, two paint trays, a box of garbage bags, three rolls of painter's tape, and a small paintbrush each for both of them, but forgot the rollers. Stunning. It's February in Las Vegas, warm enough to lounge outside in a t-shirt, and it's the first warm winter Lonin's had. The lack of snow will never stop being strange to him. Today, they'll prime the cabinets, the walls, and tomorrow, scroll a coat of red onto both. The kitchen will look more like the inside of an anatomical heart, the sinks and drawers like ventricles, but this is Eliza's vision. Her tastes come alive. The sheep are being herded by a collie. As Lonan rips another strip of tape with his teeth, he stares at the screen mounted in the corner, at the almost naked sheep dashing across a field. How many will be slaughtered, he doesn't know. The narrator must have said that, but there is no plan, really, for death. Even for sheep. He kneels toward the kitchen vent, the tape roll linked around his wrist, and smooths a line of tape down. Eliza doesn't want to paint the vent. It wouldn't complete her vision, and so it will remain the original wall color, a square of cream so worn it's almost gray. It's this he's thinking about, how tacky that one-foot-by-one-foot section will be when the rest is aching red, when his phone rings. He almost drops the roll of tape. This shouldn't be a surprise. He gets a phone call every Friday afternoon, the shrill of whatever default ringtone, just a reminder this Vegas apartment isn't the only thing that exists. But today, he jumps, almost hits his head against the edge of the counter. It's silent when he answers. This is also normal. Their code for when she isn't alone is usually a pizza order, though sometimes she changes it up. Sometimes he's a faux Greek restaurant, a faux Italian bistro. Last week, he was the usual, a pizzeria down the road. She ordered two white pizzas and a side of mozzarella sticks, which means she's stable. Anytime she orders a side, she's safe. On the other end, there's a sniffle, and then her voice, smaller today, like it's caught in the lattice of her ribs. Do you still do breadsticks? Lonan sits up. Are you alone? No, like the baked ones. I ordered those last time. Can you get alone? No, two orders, both baked. Do you want a side? Not today. Though her voice is tinny through the speaker, he hears it, just the twist of a tremble, shortening her vowels. Do you need me to come and get you? Static shuffling and then a door opening, two rattles of a rice maraca, the mildest wine. How about I call back later, she says an urgency that turns into the dull drone of the dead-end line. When Lonan pulls the phone away from his face, the sheep on the TV are being slaughtered. He knows it's impossible because they all look the same, but when he squints, he recognizes every single one of them. Lonan is heading out when Eliza is heading in. They bump into each other in the stairwell so fast Eliza drops the rollers. They clatter down to the next landing, echoing like a chorus neither want to hear. They move at the same time, Eliza toward him and Lonan toward the paint rollers. Their second collision is different this time because Lonan keeps going, down the steps until he reaches the landing. He doesn't look at her as he picks up the rollers, pretends to listen to something other than the hiss of whatever's running in the washer or floor up. They're from the Takimotos, you know them. The family, they run a restaurant downtown. Lonan doesn't know them. He hardly knows anyone in this building, and the ones he does, he sees infrequently. But he imagines a family of four, maybe, two kids, one boy, one girl, three teacup chihuahuas. He nods and gathers more rollers. She's brought so many rollers. Were you going somewhere? Maybe I should go to the Takamoto's restaurant. Lonan. He straightens and looks at her. She's bundled in her fur coat, even though she has always insisted she's good at even Vegas's warm winter. Since going vegetarian, she's insisted it's fake, even though he's read the lining tag, 100% mink. He doesn't know why she's needed her coat when she's only walked up a few flights of stairs, but doesn't care to ask. She approaches him with her thumb out, and when that thumb presses into his eye socket, he flinches. What happened here? She smooths the dip of his under eyes, her fingertips cold. He smells her perfume, different today, always different, 
a smell like cloves and lavender. Are you sleeping? She presses onto her toes, examines the other side, and her frown deepens. This doesn't look like eight hours. I'm sleeping, he says, though they both know this is a lie. It's taken her two weeks to notice. I can run to the pharmacy, she says, if you need a refill. I'm sleeping. I didn't notice this morning. I would have given you another energy shot. Eliza, he says, I'm sleeping fine. You're going somewhere, she says into his shoulder. I know you. To get takeout, he says. You can't lie to me. About takeout? She detaches herself from him and folds her arms over her chest. Mink fur spills between them, hooked neatly in the slats of each finger. Do you have my car keys? I was going to walk. Downtown to Takimoto's? I'll go somewhere else, try someplace new. Always good to find new places in walking distance. We've never had takeout from Takimoto's. So we'll have takeout from someplace else. Eliza puts her hands on her hips. Lonan unashamedly stares at the exit, and this is what he's focused on when her small hand slips around his waist. At first, he stumbles as she juts their bodies together, but finds his footing just as quickly when she dips her fingers into his pocket and pulls out her car keys. His throat warms as she holds the bundle up to his face, the warmth turning cold when he swallows. Eliza dangles the keys like a pendulum, and when he goes to snatch them back, she yanks them above both their heads. What happened to honesty? I won't be long. You're right, because I won't give them back. The clock in his head tells him it's time to go. She's delayed him enough, but when he moves, she does too. They play a game of mirror until she mimics each of his movements, even down to the slight stake of an eyebrow. Where are you going? Why are you in your fur coat? You had to collect paint rollers from the neighbors in a fur coat? Faux fur, she says. Her arms unlink over her chest, and she rummages through one of the pockets, quickly emerging with an empty carton of cigarettes. She throws the box so it lands at his feet, a card-like skitter that echoes in the stairwell. Smoking, she says. It's a pastime, don't you know? Dissolves the world, stress, worry. Now you go. My sister's in town. I want to see her. Eliza holds her head with the crook of her palm and nods. Lies don't sound good on you, she says, but tosses him the keys anyway. Tell her I say hello. Lonan goes nowhere. This is not his plan. Asphalt whips under the skin of each tire, the setting sun ringing him blind. Arizona isn't far from their apartment, but it isn't close enough, and the highway seems to stretch on for hours, though he's only been on the road for 30 minutes. Cars were around him, and he counts the red ones, blue ones, is at 15 and 22 by the time he gets to the next exit. He doesn't know where he's going. Arizona is the only thing he knows about her, doesn't know if she lives in an apartment, a duplex, a house, fully detached, semi-detached. As he pulls into a residential neighborhood somewhere along the vague line he's drawn on the map from Las Vegas to Arizona, he watches for all these options. In the distance, a jogger zags across the street with her golden retriever. Children play basketball on a driveway, still in their school uniforms. Another woman clips the wilted stems off a magnolia bush. It's when he gets closer to the apartments that the sameness is noticeable. High-rises with pearlescent windows that go pinkish in the sunset, all of them identical. Each building evenly spaced, more like a board game than a place to live. Even the space around each building is the same. The same rose hedges, the same iron fence, the same people bustling in and out all wearing some variation of pantsuit, all holding some other hand, child, partner, lover. The same haircut, smiles, eyes like marbles, as if there's a store somewhere that sells copies, a catalog for eyes that don't blink. 
He's been looking into the sun for too long. There must be a difference, but the longer he looks, the more indistinguishable they become. Eliza is waiting at home. She's called him 15 times since he left. He played one of her voicemails a few miles back, something about starting the first coat of paint without him, about calling his doctor, changing his prescription. He could make the lie true. Reeve is somewhere in the country, he imagines, dancing in a faceless city, living in a motel room, tipping everyone well. It wouldn't be hard to find her. Turning around is less of a decision and more of an inevitability. Sun catches the tips of his ears now, warms his neck in a way that's less comforting and more like the clammy hands of a mother unsure of mothering. He's grateful he won't be blinded on his way back. Eliza is bleeding by the time he gets back, on the kitchen tile, holding her forearm with a washcloth. One can of paint lies empty on the garbage bag she spread out, and half a wall is painted. The smell of chemicals sting as he inhales. Lonan hooks the car keys onto the lanyard by the front door and slings his coat across the couch. The television is set to the same channel as before, though the program has switched from sheep slaughter to bird watching. On screen, a heron perches by a riverbed, opalescent in the sunshine. Did you hurt yourself? he asks, the heron now frisking up the white bark of a tree. He glances at the fluorescent red dripping between her fingers, pattering against the tile. I was opening paint cans. With a kitchen knife. He gestures to the blade on the counter, blood-free, newly sharpened. It's all I had on hand. She pulls her wrist closer to her, runs her index finger along the injured area. The knife's clean. I washed it, Lonan. You only used one can of paint? I haven't finished the walls yet. But the other cans are unopened. Eliza sighs and wrings her arm over the sink. And what does that mean? It means you painted half a wall with a cut on your arm. A bad one, it looks like. Eliza laughs. She rocks on the balls of her bare feet, shaking her head. The heron has moved closer to the riverbed. It watches the water knowingly its subtle simmer of movement, and after a moment of watching, strikes its beak down so it spears a trout. He misses the part where it eats. Eliza's clicked off the TV from behind him. She slams the remote onto the counter so hard its back clatters off and onto the tile. I cut my arm with a kitchen knife while opening paint cans. It happens. I don't see a cut. Why would I make that up? I don't see a cut. She walks toward him. He expects her to shove her wrist in his face, but she doesn't. She just holds it, some of the blood fluorescing pink, splashing onto her toes. You got to see your sister? She asks. She canceled. Eliza clucks her tongue, examining her wrist, and then she extends her arm, revealing the full patch of pale skin gone red. Lonan takes it and with his fingernail carves a line through the red to reveal the healthy patch of skin, painted, uncut. Thanks for listening to this. (laughs) I hope I didn't do too bad. Um, My house is really loud and also my throat is kind of hurting, but I have halls next to me. But I hope you enjoyed this. Um, Here are some bloopers from this recording. This was... Feeding Habits, read by yours truly and written by yours truly. I quite like this chapter. Let me know what you guys think and if you want me to read something else from another project. But yeah, enjoy these bloopers and thank you guys for listening to this reading of chapter one of Feeding Habits. Bye. It's this he's thinking about. How tacky that one foot by... It's this he's thinking about... (laughs) Can Liam stop singing Dua Lipa? (laughs) Oh my god. Turning around is less of a decision and more of an inevitable, 
Turning around is less of a decision and more of an inevitable. I can't say that word. Oh my God. Why did I write it? Turning around is less. Turning around is less of a decision and more of an inevitability. That sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Stop texting me because I can't read my thing on my phone. Thank you. ASMR. While I wait for my family to shut the fuck up. <laughs> the Luna, do not bark. Girl.